Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. We are, this is, I think, part three, and we're skimming through parts of the book of Revelation. I'm looking at different things that I keep hearing from people, whether they be questions or comments that people make that just show that they have questions, because some of their comments show that they don't understand things as they're written. So if we understand a little more about how the book of Revelation is set up, then we can understand a little bit more the context or where these things come into play on his timeline, okay? And that's the purpose of this doing this today. Um, we spoke about, let's open up our Bibles real quick and go back to Revelation 1. So open up, and it's great if you've got a paper Bible to open up and they're going to make your notes in the column or something. That's awesome. Okay, so Revelation 1. Let me get, get there. Revelation 1, verse 19. And we've spoken about this at length. Uh, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which, uh, will, which will take place after this. Well, the, um, the things that are are chapter 1, the vision. The things, excuse me, the things which you have seen is chapter 1, the vision. The things that you, that are, are chapters 2 and 3, the letters to the church, churches, which represent all of the church age. And Paul is writing about 95, 96 AD, which is during the church age, the things that are. And the things that will take place after this. After what? After the church age. Well, if you go to Revelation 4.1, again, we spoke about this. Revelation 4.1. After these things, I look and behold a door standing open to heaven. Uh, and the first voice, which I heard like a trumpet speaking to me saying, come up here. We showed how that's a command statement. It goes back to the where Paul talked about the rapture in 1 Thessalonians 4 and that the door standing open to heaven happens on Rosh Hashanah. That's the day of the rapture. But after these things, after the church age. So let's go to where we're going to pick up in Revelation 7, and we're going to see how this starts off. Revelation 7 starts off with after these things. So in other words, remember that Revelation 4 and 5 are showing what happens in heaven right after the rapture, right after the church age. Revelation 6, the seal judgments, talks about what's happening on earth right after the church age. Revelation 7 is going to go back to right after the church age. We're going to look at these 144,000 witnesses, and these witnesses have a seven-year ministry. So they go back to the beginning of tribulation. Um, and before we jump into it, I have one other thing I want to say again. This is just these three teachings. I don't know if there's a fourth or not yet. But these three teachings that I'm doing are just skimming through some things, picking out some verses here and there, trying to get the things that people need to hear. I'm in the process of doing a, um, a longer, more detailed verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Revelation, and we just finished uh, chapter 14 of the book of Revelation in that study. So if you want more answers, that may be a good place to go to get them. All right, so after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Okay, the earth, prophetically, is Israel. The sea, prophetically, is Gentile nations. And trees, prophetically, are kingdoms. The winds represent destruction. This represents tribulation starting. There is a slight delay. We've spoken about how the rapture happens, has to happen on Rosh Hashanah, and the tribulation ends on Yom Kippur. So it being perfect seven years on God's calendar. So in other words, it can't happen in Mar March, April, June, December, because tribulation has to be a perfect set of seven years on God's calendar. Now, it's, and it starts right after the rapture, because Messiah starts by saying things that will happen quickly. In other words, with speed, like a tachometer. So, 
there, we see that there is seven days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And during that seven days, one of the things that's going to happen is sealing of the 144,000 witnesses, 144,000 Apostle Paul type people who take the gospel message out to the world during tribulation. Okay, and we also saw that during that time is when the Bema Seat judgment happens, when we are given crowns, the raptured and resurrected saints receive their rewards, their crowns, and we cast them back off to Messiah. I saw another angel ascend out of the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom was gathered to harm the earth and sea. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants on their foreheads. Um, it, this doesn't have to be a literal um, sealing. We looked at, I always forget, is it Jeremiah or Ezekiel? Let's try Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 8. Ezekiel 9. Yes, we talked about, and we I'm not going to read through all of this. You can come back and read through it in Ezekiel 9 about how there were um, six men with battle axes, and then one man went and put a writer's inkhorn on its, uh, at his side, and he went and sealed he went and sealed everybody who cried and moaned and mourned over the atrocities that were happening at the temple. And then the men with battle axes went in and killed everybody. That's not what actually happened. Physically, from this on our realm, this is what happened on a spiritual realm, okay? And when, when Nebuchadnezzar, God's servant, Babylon destroyed Israel, there was no mention of an angel going through marking people. There is no mention of six guys with battle axes, okay? Those are angels who facilitated what was going on. So the seals that, uh, that these four living creatures have, or these six, I'm sorry, that the, that the, the person with the ink corner are sealing people with does not have to be literal, just as the mark of the beast does not have to be literal. All right, um, that's not where I wanted to be. Let's go to, back to Revelation 7. And there are 12,000, and they are from the 12 tribes of Israel. You'll notice that Dan is not mentioned there. Um, and you get, there's going to be Joseph, and there's got to be one of Joseph's sons in here somewhere. Manasseh, right there. That's one of the sons of Joseph. So Joseph gets a double blessing. Um, because I looked after, and I looked and behold a great multitude, which no one could number, of tr nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God, clothed in white. We talked about white, how that means it, it's the... Um, the robe that be worn at a wedding feast and the father provides the war, the robes. Yeah, this is all tied into the wedding feast to the, um, the appointed times of the Lord. They're all connected together. Um, but it's because those robes are washed in the blood of Messiah that they are white and spotless and blameless. Um, but these are not the raptured and resurrected saints. They, and this is not the rapture. Because we're going to see down here. Um, then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are those arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones that came out of the great tribulation. That's the second half, the second three and a half years of tribulation. And washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So these 144,000 Jewish men who did not get raptured, they were not saved beforehand, but when they saw the rapture happen, they knew enough to say, oh my goodness, we missed it. That Jewish boy 2,000 years ago, he was the Messiah. And that they will turn and repent and turn to God as soon as the rapture happens. 
Um, they are the fulfillment of what we see in Matthew 24, verse, I believe it's 14. Yes. Yeah. And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all of the world as uh, witnesses to all nations, and then the end will come. That word end is telos, telos, which actually means the goal, the goal bringing in the millennial kingdom. They keep translating it as end when it should be goal. Um, and this is talking about during tribulation. These are the birth pains. The birth pains are tribulation. And so many people believe that this verse means that the, the gospel has to be preached everywhere, all over the world, before the rapture can happen. That's not what it means at all. In fact, I was at the Bible Museum in D.C., and they have a little room, and it has, like, all the languages of the world and, you know, what state the Bible is in. We were, like, forever away from having a Bible in the language of everybody on earth. Oh, my goodness. It's not what it means. It's not what has to happen. Let's go back. Um, yeah, and these are the ones, when these tribulation saints, it's in Revelation 20, when they come back. And I saw the thrones up and set on them. And notice thrones, plural. Yeah, we're going to be, what are we going to be? Priests, kings and priests. Yeah, yeah, we're the 24 elders. And they sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Two things. Uh, the witness for Jesus and the word of God, um, who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received the mark on the foreheads. And they lived with and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That word, the, is actually better translated, excuse me, a is actually better translated as the, because the rapture and tribulation are the beginning of the thousand year period. And you can go into Blue Letter Bible and look up the definition, and you'll see that. Hold on one second. Hey, that was my son. He's in the process of buying a car, and I had to take that phone call. Um, now, I'm not sure exactly what I finished saying. But anyhow, so the thousand years starts it is, starts with the rapture and tribulation. But this is where we, this, the saints, the uh, 24 elders, which represents Jews and Gentiles who belong to Messiah, who get the rapture and resurrected saints, will be sitting on these thrones. Um, while we're here, the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection, this here. And that resurrection has three parts. There is, just like a Harvest has three parts. There is the first fruits of the resurrection, which Messiah is the first fruits to the resurrection of life. And along with Messiah, if you go into, is it Matthew 27, 50? I think that's it. Matthew 27, verse 50-ish. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's what a father would do when he loses his firstborn. Kind of interesting. And this is the veil that goes into the Holy of Holies, which represents we now have the, the, the ability to come into the throne room of God figuratively, but to come into the presence of God through prayer. Um, we do not need an intermediary, despite what some religions would tell you. Um, and the earth, the earth quaked and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Dead people came back to life. Um, and coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is the, this is the first fruits of the resurrection. Did these people die later? Did these people bodies go to heaven? I don't know, but Messiah is the first fruits, and there are other people that arose with him. Then you have the main harvest. That's Revelation 4.1. And then you have the gleanings. Revelation 4.1, the rapture. And then you have the gleanings. That is what we read about in Revelation 20. And this is the first. This is the first resurrection. It's in three parts. The second resurrection is not good. That's the resurrection of the dead who were not sleeping. They're dead dead. That's the great white throne judgment, which is talked about here. Blessed and holy is he who has a part in the first resurrection. 
all the way up to the, tri the, the tribulation saints. Over such the second death, the second death is eternal death, which is at the great white throne judgment, has no power. And they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And again, it's for the thousand years. Um, all right, let's go back to... I'm not going back all over the place. Revelation 7. Where do I want to go next? What's verse 9? Okay, I've covered this. All right, let's go to chapter 8. Read 1 and 2. When he opened the seventh seal. Okay, so that's what normally happens. You talk about the six of them, and then there's one that's left a little bit. And this is the one that's left for a little bit. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Oh, these are the trumpet judgments. You notice how the trumpet judgments come out of the seventh seal? So the first six seals have to be opened before the trumpet judgments start. And I say this because a lot of people will sit here and say, well, no, 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 no. The um, seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments, they are actually all the same judgments, and you're looking at them from a different angle. No. No, because this shows a sequential order to these judgments. Make sense? Hopefully it does. Um, I'm not going to walk through the, the these all of these together. I mean, you know, um, uh, judgment by judgment by judgment. We do that in the longer teaching series. I just want to point out one verse here, six. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Anybody ever been, been in a band or an orchestra? When do you prepare yourself to sound? When you're about to blow your instrument. Okay? So... The trumpet judgments happen relatively fast succession. Where th that means the seal judgments take a period of time. Um, there is another thing I want to look at. I want to look at the sixth trumpet here while we're here. And that's in the next chapter, in chapter 9. Oh, which verse is it? 9... Um, and then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden offer, which is before the God, saying, and there's going to be a lot of things in, from heaven that people are going to be hearing here on earth. This is one of them, saying to the sixth angel that had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates River. So the four angels had been prepared for that day excuse me, for that hour and day and month and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. There's another two billion people died. Remember we had eight billion and a quarter was killed. That's four, two billion. So we're down to six billion. And now another third of that has died. Has died. That's another two billion people dead. Wow. That's half the world's population. Um, so we have this army coming. And now it says that the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. That one always blew me away. How do you get a 200 man, million man army? Guess what? It's not. That's a bad translation. Let's look at it real quick. Horsemen were two. What is this word right here? Two. The two. The twain. It's two. Okay, so this is two. And the next word, thousand, could be um, 10,000 times 10,000, 200,000. This has been, in, been interpreted. An innumerable multitude. 10,000. Okay, 10,000 is an innumerable multitude with unlimited number unlimited uh, in innumerable hosts. So this is not 200 million, it could be. 
I believe it is just an innumerable number times two. Double that. It's just so many armies that it's unbelievable. Um, when we see this, this to me, and I believe it is, this is where Gog, the Battle of Gog and Magog would come in during the Sixth Trumpet, because it is during the Battle of Gog and Magog where the Lord's going to step in, Israel's going to repent, and in the Revelation 12, Israel is heading off to Petra. Okay, so let's look real quick at Ezekiel 36, excuse me, um, Ezekiel 38, and look at one verse there to see the purpose of that battle. The last verse in Ezekiel 38. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, that I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. Well, there will be a point at the end of tribulation where nations are judged, and that's uh, spoken about um, in Joel 3, the Valley of Jehoshaphat, the Valley of Decision. But it's also in Matthew 25 where Messiah is going to judge the nations. And we see in places like um, Isaiah 7 or 9, near the end, it talks about how there's going to be a road between Egypt and Assyria. And he's talking about, let's actually go there. I just want to explain, show you something. Isaiah, it's 7 or 9, I get him confused. No, it's 7. Isaiah 7. Oh, that ain't it. Hold on. It's um, 19. I'm sorry, Isaiah 19. We're just going to read um, from 23 to 25. In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria. Hmm. Egypt and Assyria, they're like kind of enemies, especially Assyria. These are Psalm 83 countries that will lose that battle. And the Assyrians come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. Who are they serving? In that day, there will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts, that's an end times prophecy, shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. How do they get that status? It's because, let's go back. It's because right here, eh, it's because at this point they knew who God was and they turned to God and said, Oh, Allah is not the, it's not God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is God. And it's how you treat Israel in the last half of tribulation from the time that you turn as a country. And you see that in Matthew 25. All right. Um, and this is where Israel will, will turn to God. And that's how there's a remnant. One third of Israel will turn and know who Messiah is. And when the time comes, head to Petra. And we'll talk about that a little later. Let's go back to book of Revelation. You know, on second thought, let's go to Matthew. Um, let's go to Matthew 24. I want to show you something. You know, so far, first half of tribulation, half the world is dead. Okay. That's 4 billion people. So go to Matthew 24, and this is where I get a song in my head. You ain't seen nothing yet. Down now, oh baby, baby. Oh, never mind, I won't sing that. Anyhow, now you got a song stuck in your head if you knew that one. Um, now I want to go to, what verse is it? 15 through 21. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Whomever reads, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetop go down and, and not go down and take anything out of his house. Why not? Well, back in that day, the houses were so close together in Jerusalem, you could run across all the rooftops 
all the rooftops and be out of the city without ever putting your foot on the ground. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. In other words, there's some urgency here to get going. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babes in those days. And I missed the verse I wanted to get to here. No, there it is. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, because winter is going to be harder to travel. And they're walking. They're not flying. God's not miraculously taking them out. For then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the world, beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever, ever shall be. So the tribulation, the great tribulation makes the first part of tribulation look like child's flesh. This is far worse. That just blows my mind. And guess what? If you're, if you are in Christ, if you came to know Messiah during tribulation, um, and you became one of the saints during tribulation, it's actually good that you're dead at this point. Why would you say that? Go to Revelation 14. Verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Follow them. Yeah, because you're going to get judged by your works. Did you really have to go and say that? It's no, it's works doesn't mean you're trying to do it on your own. Everybody gets judged by their work. I know somebody out there thought that. Um, just real quick. And behold, I am coming quickly. That's with speed. So when everything starts happening, it's happening fast. And I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me. Guess what? Your reward could be your crown. You becoming king or priest, or it could be being thrown into a lake of fire to give to everyone according to his work. So when you get people who start getting on tirades about your works and you don't, I mean, no, they don't save you. We're saved by grace through faith, but those things are um, ongoing, continual action. Um, but if you love Messiah, you're going to obey him. You need to have a Lord, not just a Savior. You need a Lord also. If you're not obedient, you don't want Messiah coming to you and saying, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I tell you to do? Anyhow. Um, but the fact that great the Great Tribulation is so much worse. And while we were back there, we're supposed to go one other place. In Revelation 14... Have you seen the people that try to count the 1,260 days and they do it on a um, pagan Roman calendar and they come up with all kinds of dates? There's a problem with that. Uh, first of all, it's got to, you got to count on God's calendar. And that could change depending on when they see the sign, the suns. It could change a day or something here and there when they see the, excuse me, the new moon. Um, also, when the barley is a veeb, you could lose 30 days or there could be 30 days that happen, yet the months don't change. But see, not only do you need 1,260 days, let me show you something real quick. Verse 11, and the smoke of their torments is sent forever. Oh, we want to go to, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Go, to, go back a chapter. No, it should be 14. Hmm, give me a second here. Yeah, we want to be in Revelation 12, so go ahead and turn there. I want to show you something, because people that count that, they miss other things. So first go to verse 6. And this is all about Israel being hidden in Petra for the second half of tribulation, for the great tribulation. And the woman who fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that that they should feed her for 1,260 days. Okay, so people try to count 1,260 days. But they also, you have to keep in consideration verses like number 14. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle. We talked about that. That means God's protection. 
that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for times, times, and half a times from the presence of the serpent. So not only do your 1,260 days have to work out, but it also has to be specifically three and a half years on God's calendar. And that's what people miss. And it also has to be 42 months. And there's another scripture for that. So your months have to be perfect as well. Not easy to do all that. Um, you know, this time, the Great Tribulation, being unlike anything else that has ever been seen before, Messiah is just quoting Daniel on that, believe it or not. Let's go and see what Daniel has to say. Um, we actually want to go to Daniel 12. And Daniel 12 is pretty much all about the second half of Tribulation. Some people take Daniel 12 to say that tribulation is only three and a half years. That's ridiculous. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Michael stands up when? Revelation 12, when, he, when Satan is cast down to heaven, or down to earth, excuse me. The prince, um, so, so Michael shall stand up. It's time for him to go to war. Uh, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. So he is the protector of Israel. There shall be a time of trouble, that's a time of Jacob's trouble, of tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. That's um, Jeremiah 30, that Israel gets saved out of tribulation. And this is the second half of tribulation when they are taken into um, Petra. But at the same thing, Messiah was said. And Everyone whose name is found written in the book. That's the Lamb's Light Book of Life. While we're here, that we just heard about the Messiah talked about when you see the abomination of desolation. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,000 290 days. That's an extra 30 days. They're going to be in Petra for times, times, and half a times for 1,260 days. They need time to get there. This happens 30 days before the midpoint. And if you did the math, and the midpoint's going to run hit like on um, Passover, 30 days before that, what day is that? It's Purim. That goes back to the time with Queen Esther. And if they, a joyous day celebrating, Get this, Israel being saved out of utter annihilation. Wow. And that's exactly what it is when they see the abomination of desolation set up. Okay, now if we go over to Revelation 13, we get the two witnesses. We saw them at the Mount of Transfiguration. This is Moses and Elijah. Um, I know, I know, I didn't think it was Moses before, but it's definitely, it's Moses and Elijah. Um, I used to think Enoch. But no, 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 it's Moses. Moses is the one that performed all the plagues on the ground but uh, or to the earth. But we're not going to really spend time on that. I want to look at the seventh trumpet and one verse in particular, verse 15. So 11, 15. Here's another place where people try to put the rapture in. And you'll see that nobody's getting raptured at this point. But it says, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, and I bet those loud voices in heaven are heard on earth. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of the Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. All right. Has this happened at this point? All right. We haven't got to the second half of tribulation yet. If the kingdoms of the heaven have become the kingdom of the Lord, why is he going to pour out so much worse devastation on his kingdoms all over the world? No, it's not. But people try to take this and make it into something it's not. This is what's called, we spoke before about how the book of Revelation was written in Hebrew, not Greek. This would be a prophetic perfect tense of a verb. A prophecy that is so assured of coming true that it is said as if it did come true. When you see the prophecy back in Isaiah about Satan, that he had fallen from heaven, 
He didn't fall from heaven at that point because he's our accuser and he's going before the Lord accusing us of things. It's not until Revelation 12 that he's actually kicked out of heaven and he has no access to heaven. <laughs> That's what this is. Remember the seal judgments and how the, the document that has seven seals would be a, hold on one second, is a land title, a title deed to the property and that, um, which Adam lost long ago, and that this world is not Messiah's, and that in Matthew 3, 4, when he's in the wilderness, and Satan says, hey, you know what, let's go up on this high mountain, look down, I'll give you all of this, if you just get down and worship me. And Messiah didn't say, yeah, right, how are you going to give me something that's mine to start with? Messiah didn't say that, did he? No. He's taking it back. This doesn't happen until Armageddon. But people will try to make a rapture here at this point or make something more out of this than it really is. Um, let's go and look at when Messiah takes it back real quick. And we could go to Revelation 19 where he comes back. But let's instead go to Psalm 20. I like Psalm 20. It's kind of cool. When in Revelation 19, who knows what Messiah has in his mouth when he comes back? That's right, a sword. What is the sword? Yep, it's the word of God. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Vain means it's not going to come to fruition. It's worthless. The kings of the earth set themselves up, and the rulers take counsel together. There's a conspiracy. Against the Lord, caps, L-O-R-D, caps, that's a tetragrammaton, that is God the Father, the name that they do not say. Against his anointed, Messiah, saying, let us break their bonds, uh, let us break their bonds, in pieces and cast away so their cords from us and cast away their cords from it. They don't want Messiah to reign on earth because Messiah because the Satan wants to be like God. He who is in heaven shall laugh, and the Lord shall hold them in derision. Derision is a laugh. It's like you see somebody doing something so dumb, they're gonna get hurt. And it may be really bad, but you can't help laughing. It's that dumb. That's like laughing in derision. It's not like laughing that somebody told you a really funny joke. It's a half laugh. You know what I'm saying. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. He speaks. It's over. That's all it is. He speaks. It's over. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill. And this is where Messiah is reigning. Um, and we've looked there so many times in Ezekiel 43. This is where Messiah walks through the eastern gate, sits on the throne of David, where he will reign in the midst of the children of Israel forever. Let's go one other place. And this is what happens when Messiah speaks. And it shall be the, this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. This is Armageddon afterwards. Their flesh shall dissolve as they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. And their tongue shall dissolve in their mouth. He speaks and they just sort of dissolve. Um, you know, if you want to get a kind of a picture of this, and it's not a perfect picture, it's a Hollywood picture of this. Think about Raiders of the Lost Ark. Indy and the girl are hiding behind the rock and hiding their eyes, and the German, the bad German people open up the Ark of the Covenant, the, the crate, and the laser beams come out and everybody just melts away and dissolves. Where do you think Steven Spielberg, a Jew, got the idea? Right here from Zechariah 14. All right. Um, where do we want to go from here? Chapter 12. Midpoint of Tribulation. Satan gets cast down after he loses the battle with um, Michael. And, you know, and a third of the stars, stars are oftentimes angels. So you have a third of the angels were thrown down to heaven as well. They are demons. Um, 
And Revelation 12, everything here happens in the midpoint. Um, and the, the woman is heading to Petra. So let's just look real quick. Why do I keep saying that she's going to head to Petra? Petra is actually that in Indiana Jones, they went through that like valley and you got all the rocks and everything up there in the cliffs. That's Petra. That's an area in today, Jordan. It's an air, it's a tourist area that has a half a million rooms there, a really nice source of water, and an amphitheater that holds all kinds of people. Yeah, God's prepared that place for them. Um, we're going to look at a couple verses real quick just to say why Petra. Um, let's go start in Revelation 12, where... And verse 14, but the woman was given the wings of a great eagle. We've talked about how that is just a protection, um, that she may fly into the wilderness to her place, where she will be nourished for times, times, and half a times from the presence of the serpents. So it's a place that is a wilderness, or at least it was at the time that John wrote. In Matthew 24, Verse, I can't read my handwriting. I think it's 15, but I'll have no problem finding it. Matthew 24, verse 15. When you see the um, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet standing in the holy place, let him who is in Judea flee to the mountains. So there, it's mountains and a desert. Understand, desert also means a lack of water. Holy Spirit, a lack of God. So we have those two things that we're working with here. We know from Revelation 12 that it happened. We've already been there 30 days prior to the midpoint. Um, let's go to Daniel 11. Verses 40 and 41. This is talking about where the Antichrist and his armies in the sec or during tribulation, um, at the time of the end, the south shall attack him, attacking the, and it's probably Egypt that's attacking him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through them. And this is the Antichrist who's going to go into these many countries, including the promised land. Is that the United States? No. Right here, this is the verse, the glorious land. And he shall enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape for his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. Where is that? That's Jordan. That's where Petra is. That place is protected, and the Antichrist cannot get there. That's what this verse is telling us. Now, if we want to be more specific about it, Isaiah can help out with that. Where's my verse? Isaiah 16. Send the lamb to the ruler of the land from Selah to the wilderness. What is Selah? Rock, a place in Edom, perhaps an early name for Petra. Edom is where Petra is. It's telling you where they're going to get sent to. For it shall be a wandering bird thrown out of its nest, and so shall the daughters of Moab and the fords of Yaman. Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the spoiler, the Antichrist. For the extortioner is at an end. Devastation ceases. The oppressors are consumed out of the land. Messiah comes back and kicks some butt. In mercy, the throne will be established, and the one who sits uh, and one, Messiah, will sit on it in truth. In the tabernacle of David, he's going to be sitting on the throne of David, judging and seeking justice and hastening righteousness, bringing in righteousness. Um... Now, we get into Revelation 13 and 14. 
and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in here, I think. Yeah, we're going to wrap this up in a little bit, and it's probably going to be the end of this little mini-series. Let's go to Revelation 13 and 14. Revelation 13 and 14 are an introduction to the Great Tribulation. It's what Satan, and 13 is what Satan and his minions intend to do. Revelation 14 is what Messiah will do. Okay? And then you get into the bold judgments and to the end, and, and everything plays out from there. And we're not going to spend a lot of time here. Look at um, Revelation 13 gives us the mark of the bees. Give me a second. That's exactly where I want to go with this. Um, let's start off with 13.5. So the Antichrist, then you have the different being here. You have the different beings here. You have the beast who's the Antichrist. You have the false prophet, and Satan has thrown down from heaven. Satan has indwelled the Antichrist. So the Antichrist now has this enormous power, and but the false prophet can only do these things in his presence. Okay, and I could spend forever talking about this chapter, but we're not going to be here that long. Keep in mind that he, the power that he has is for forty-two months. So that last half of tribulation, not only is it 1,260 days, times, times, and half a times, three and a half years, and it is also 42 months. So if anybody's trying to count 1,260 days to try to figure out how the days and the numbers line up, you got to make sure the years are right and the months are right too. Every scripture, you don't just pick a cherry pick a scripture. Um, but he is given Power. He is given authority to, to, to continue for 42 months. This is con consistent with what we see in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, verse 25. Daniel 7 is four beasts, a lion, um, lion, leopard, and bear. Then one that's unlike, is diverse from all the rest. Ten, that the ten, and, it has, and this fourth beast has ten horns that come out of its head. I believe that's the ten like regions of the New World Order, the One World Government. And you have to go back a little ways to look at this. And it, it's the whole world. Who shall arise from this kingdom? And another, uh, and another shall arise after them. That's the Antichrist. Um, and he shall be different from the first ones and subdue three kings. This is when Satan comes down and indwells the Antichrist. He shall speak most pompous words against the Most High, and shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and the law. And the saints shall be given into his hands, given into his hands for times, times, and half a times. Um, I've said it before. It's not that God is cruel and all this. God brings about... Um, Judgment in order to bring repentance, which can lead to us being um, saved by repenting when we have no other choice. It is rare that I've heard the story about the guy that had the perfect life, the perfect wife, the perfect dog, the perfect house, the perfect job. Everything was so wonderful, and they had to find Messiah. No, it's usually in desperation that you reach out to him. Notice that the, so the saints are given into his hands for times, times, and half a times. Um, same thing we saw in Revelation 13. And that Satan, as he's indwelling the Antichrist, shall intend to change the times and the laws. Those are the appointed times of Messiah. Some people call them the Jewish feast day. Messiah calls them his. And the law is Torah. If Messiah already did this, why would the Antichrist try to do it? Better yet, if the Antichrist intends to do it, why would Messiah do it? Interesting. Let's go back. See what else we want to glean out of here. Yeah. Um, as we go down here to the end, we see the mark of the beast. He causes all, both great small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and their foreheads. I believe that's connected to Deuteronomy 6. 
when Messiah was asked what is the most important part of the scriptures, uh, of the law, he went to Deuteronomy 6 to love the Lord your God with everything you got. Go back and read it. And you'll see why I say that this is connected to the mark of the beast. That no one may buy or sell unless he has the mark. And again, it doesn't have to be a literal mark. It could be, but it doesn't have to be. The name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, let him who has, here is wisdom. Let him who has the understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the n number of a man. His number is 666. It's a man. The, the Antichrist is a man is a person, a human being. It's not a government entity. I've had people trying to tell, explain that to me, that it's this government entity or world global entity. No, it's not. It's a person. Um, this is gematria. You can take a name and break it down and get words um, and get numbers out of it. Go to Matthew 1 to the genealogy of Messiah. I want to show you where, the, where Matthew uses this. One of the most important things, when, when Messiah goes through the genealogy of Messiah, is he's trying to show how, he's, how Messiah is fulfilling all these prophecies out of the line on which um, Messiah will come from. And David is probably the most important one because he's going to be sitting on the throne of David. Let's read this one, and, and you tell me how many times the word David shows up. So all the generations from, from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the captivity in Babylon are, Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity of Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. First thing i got to say, there's a whole lot more generations than that. He just picked 14, 14, 14. How many times do you see David? Well... David is Dalav Vav Dalav. If you take the gematria for those three letters, it totals 14. David's in here five times. One other interesting thing, if you if you go back and you count this third set, I guess nobody's ever wanted to do that. It tells you there's 14. There's only 13 names there. Was God wrong? No, it wasn't written in Greek. It was written in Hebrew. There is the Doodle version, a Hebrew version, which is in a library in France that was saved out of when Rome was destroying anything Jewish-type books. And it has 14. Hmm, I wonder which one was written first. Back to Revelation 13. My point here about the mark of the beast. Revelation 13. Is that... This happens during the Great Tribulation. You have to worship the beast. Okay? It's not something like I'm going to fall down and, oops, I got the mark. It's not out there today. If you get back a credit card and it has a 666 on it, it doesn't mean you have the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast doesn't happen until the second half of Tribulation. And guess what? We're not here. Revelation 14, and we're going to wrap up here shortly. And you know that because you can see the time when I finished. I can't. But in Revelation 14, I have no idea what I'm going to end up saying, so that's why I don't know. Why am I not in Revelation? Yeah, I am. Um, Revelation 14 talks again about the 144,000. They're the ones that are reaching out to, for Messiah. Um, you have angels going over, speaking to men with a loud voice. Babylon has fallen. Babylon has fallen. I actually believe that's the United States at this point, but yeah, we'll see. A third angel follows. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on, of their forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of the God. Because Babylon, the harlot, in Revelation 17, drank from that, the wine of that's not good, which is poured out full strength, no mercy, into the cup of his indignation, wrath. And he, shall be, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. So if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And you got an angel going through the earth um, telling people this. Oh, my goodness. Um, well, another cool thing here. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the voice of harpists playing their harps. 
that harp is playing the harps. If you trace it out through the Old Testament, it actually talks about the utter joy that we're going to have in the millennial kingdom with Messiah. And you'd have to go to the teaching that I did on Revelation 14, uh, the uh, the first one in Revelation 14. I think there are several teachings that walk through Revelation 14, and that one is really cool. The last thing I want to cover is if you come down here and you see the angel <laughs> that came out with a sickle, and this is the great harvest. This, this, These two harvests, the wheat here, that goes to, this is Armageddon. Um, and this is the two men in the field. This is Matthew 13. Check out the teaching on Revelation 14, the last one. I just did it not long ago. Um, but see the wine press that was trampled outside of the city and the blood came out from the wine press? If you look at wine press, I'm going to take you to Revelation 19. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. We've talked about that. And with it, he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rule of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of wrath of God Almighty. So even though it's spoken about here in Matthew 14, it doesn't happen until Armageddon, until Matthew 19, or excuse me, Revelation 19, when Messiah comes back. We also see it in Isaiah 63. Why is your apparel red, and all of your garments are like one who treads in the wine press? I have trodden the wine press alone. Messiah is the one that does it. When he speaks, it's over. We're just witnesses. We're not fighting. And from the peoples, no one was with me, for I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all of my robes. I have people I hear talking about the wine press and the harvest of the grapes of that in Revelation 14 as if it's the rapture, as if it's a good thing. No, no, we don't want to be trampled down like that. Anyhow, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this and got something out of it. I just see a lot of people when they ask, they ask questions or they speak in ways that I know that there are questions. And I tried to walk through some of these to answer some of them. Maybe later down the road, as my the Bible and the, the Bible study in the Book of Revelation continues, I'll do this again and carry on from here. But I just wanted to sort of take a little glance or a little walk through the Book of Revelation, um, parts of it, to answer some questions. Um, if you got other questions, please feel free to ask. May God bless you and thank you for watching. Take care.